Well, I'm thrilled to hear so much of the New Testament quoted. Unfortunately, uh, I would honestly say that was the greatest demonstration of verses taken out of context and misinterpreted in the shortest period of time that I've ever heard in my life. Now, we were just told nothing was taken out of context. Everything was quoted out of context, just pulled out. But I want to go very briefly and deal with the key things that were said uh, as quickly as possible, remembering that as we refute them one by one, doesn't matter if a thousand arguments were given, zero plus zero plus zero equals zero. And then I seek to take the rest of the time to demonstrate our point. Uh, we were told that there are ten characteristics of the Messiah according to the Jewish prophets. What we weren't told was that not one single passage quoted anywhere in the Hebrew Bible or referred to mentions Mashiach. In other words, this is interpretation telling you that these are messianic passages. How do we know that these alone are messianic passages? How do we know that these tell the whole story? Not a single one said Mashiach. Now, what we must do is go through the scriptures and see how the messianic idea developed and then see what the prophets did speak of and then see who fulfilled them. In terms of some of the specific objections, we were told, for example, that the Messiah was to be a descendant of David and that tribal affiliation is determined paternally according to the Torah. And Numbers was cited. In point of fact, the opposite is true in cases where there is not a male father uh, so that uh, the, the father, the male dies and only women are left, then tribal affiliation will come through the women and you can find that at the end of the book of Numbers. What do you do with the case that according to rabbinic tradition and certain passages in scripture it's understood that Messiah could well be a pre-existent one, in other words greater than just man. Well, the New Testament gives us the answer. Through his mother, he is a physical descendant of David, but he is greater than David. That's the whole reason that the New Testament speaks of a virgin birth. So he is not just a son of David, but greater than David. Uh, we are told, according to Hosea, which I know meant Hosea 3, the Messiah will only come after years of exile and years without a temple and sacrifice. Quite the contrary. Hosea 3 says, only after many, many, many years of desolation will the people of Israel then seek the Lord and David their king. In other words, this is not someone who is now going to come, but this is after years and years and years of being without him that they will then seek him. Why? Because he had come before that time of exile. We were told, according to the book of Ezekiel, that the Messiah will build the temple. Where did Ezekiel say those words? We were told that there will be restoration after Messiah comes. Where did the prophets explicitly say those words? We were told that when the Messiah comes, there will be no more evil or sin. The glory of God will fill the earth. It is true. There are many prophecies about the Messiah, the King, who will bring all these things to pass. But none of these passages mentioned, none of these so-called descriptions of the Messiah mention the problem of human sin. We don't need a king to just show up one day. We don't need someone to snap their fingers and suddenly there's no more war. It's like our, our dear, respected former president, Jimmy Carter, going to Bosnia, and now there's peace. It doesn't just happen so easily unless there's a heart change. I'll show you that Messiah first had to come and deal with sin, that he was not just a king, but also a priest. Uh, we were told that there will be no disease when Messiah comes, according to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, again, does not explicitly mention Messiah, but it does say that there will be great miracles of healing, which, in fact, were the hallmark of Jesus' ministry. We were told, for example, that the second coming is a myth and contradicts Jesus' own words. Jesus is the one that said that the kingdom of God would be like a king going into a distant country, and people would all think he was delaying his coming. So it would only be after a long period that he would return. What about some of the passages referred to briefly, like Matthew 16? There's some tasting here who will not see death until the Son of Man comes in the glory of his kingdom. Keep reading into the very next chapter, Matthew 17, where it says that he was glorified in their presence and there was a manifestation of the kingdom. Matthew, Mark, Luke all have that same sequence. What of Matthew 24? All these things will be fulfilled before this generation passes. The Greek word generation can also be spoken and translated nation. The very same word is also nation, meaning this particular race. This particular race, the Jewish people, is still here. 
And many of those prophecies of which he did speak were fulfilled in that first generation of Israel also. The words of Jesus on the cross, it is finished, are not words of defeat, but words saying it has all been accomplished. Read John 19.28 before you read John 19.30. We're told that Jesus was a contentious transgressor. Let me just read you a couple of quotes, just so you can hear what other Jewish scholars say. This is not proof, but I just want you to know that Rabbi Shochet's position is not the only position. According to Rabbi Leo Beck, who was a great defender of Judaism in the years of the Holocaust in Germany, he said, Jesus is a genuine per Jewish personality. All his struggles and works, his bearing and feeling, his speech and silence bear the stamp of a Jewish style. He was a Jew among Jews. According to Martin Buber, respected professor from Hebrew University two generations ago. He said, we must overcome the superstitious fear which we harbor about the messianic movement of Jesus, and we must place the movement where it belongs, namely in the spiritual history of Judaism. According to the great Israeli scholar of last generation, Joseph Klausner, Jesus was a Jew and he remained a Jew until his last breath. His one idea was to implant within his nation the idea of the coming of the Messiah. And all this, Jesus is the most Jewish of Jews, more Jewish than Hillel. From the standpoint of general humanity, he is indeed a light to the Gentiles. According to modern Orthodox Israeli scholar Pinchas Lapid, Jesus was utterly true to the Torah, as I myself hope to be. I even suspect that Jesus was even more true to the Torah than I, an Orthodox Jew. Strange that there are such different views here. According to a recent presentation by Rabbi Professor Shia Cohen, a respected historian at the Jewish Theological Seminary, he said the old view is that Jesus was a lawbreaker. Now we realize that he was an absolute Torah-keeping observant Jew, although he differed with some of the rabbinic traditions in his day, and there were many different traditions and many different viewpoints, just as today there were Reformed Jews and conservative and orthodox and ultra-orthodox and Hasidic, etc., etc. There were different views then. Jesus is considered by modern Jewish scholarship to have been totally faithful to the biblical law, although rejecting some current traditions. Shia Cohn went on to say that the old view then was that Jesus, okay, maybe he was a good Jew, so now we know that Paul was the bad guy. He said, but the new Jewish consensus is that Paul was also an observant Jew. Well, where, where, where do we get these deep contradictions from? Let's just take a look very quickly. Jesus was a contentious transgressor. He condoned Sabbath breaking. He absolutely did not condone Sabbath breaking, but he broke free from binding religious tradition. It was not work on the Sabbath to rub some grain between your hands and eat. That was not work. There is no evidence anywhere in Scripture that that would be punishable by death, although Rabbi Shochet said that that would have been punished by capital punishment. We're told, for example, that he mocked the dietary laws. Actually, what he explained was nothing that you eat actually defiles the inner man. But we know that years later, Peter could say, I've never eaten anything unclean. And for 400 years as recorded by the early historians, Nazarenes, Messianic Jews, Jewish followers of Jesus, were recognized by the church because they all kept the biblical law, although they rejected rabbinic tradition and yet followed Jesus. Strange that if Jesus mocked all these things and made them void, that his followers continued to keep these. We're told that he rejected ritual hand washing. Why shouldn't he? It's not taught in the Bible. It's a rabbinic tradition. He can reject it if he feels it's contrary to Scripture. We're told he rejected ordained fasts in Matthew 6. Read it. It's not there. We're told he rejected honoring parents. No, what he said, and I quote Rabbi Shochet from a debate, uh, from a lecture he gave in Australia, to paraphrase, is that he said that allegiance to God must come first even before one's allegiance to parents. And according to Rabbi Shochet, that's correct for any religion. Any religion would actually teach that. We're told that Jesus cursed, threatened, and planned revenge. No, what he said and what the listeners understood him to say was that God himself would execute vengeance on those who rejected the Messiah. A thoroughly biblical teaching and a thoroughly right teaching. Jesus himself told his followers, don't fight for me. He told them, don't try and defend me. He said, my kingdom is not just of this world, otherwise my servants would be fighting for me. And we know generation in, generation out of true Christians, not those that call themselves Christians and denied it by their very actions, 
But generation after generation has blessed those that cursed them. As I think of, of uh, Jewish Christians who survived the Holocaust, who lost their entire families to the Nazis, weeping with Nazis and forgiving them and seeing that open the door to these people truly repenting. They learned that spirit from Jesus. We're told according to Matthew 5, Jesus said that you had to keep rabbinic law. He did not say that. He said you had to be faithful to Torah that would not be abrogated until heaven and earth passed away or until everything was fulfilled. And he warned against rabbinic tradition and said, you've got to be more righteous than these people because some of them are actually hypocritical. Not all, but some of them are hypocritical. He did not just willingly make or break commandments. And yes, he did have the authority as Messiah to pronounce forgiveness of sins and bring people into right reconciliation with God. More importantly, we were told that he violated don't add or don't subtract. In point of fact, it is rabbinic Judaism that has violated don't add to the commandments or don't subtract. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of things that rabbinic Jews do today in great sincerity, in great zeal, in great devotion that are not found anywhere in Torah and yet they are considered binding law by the thousands. Just start sitting down and reading Talmud and look at all the things discussed. Look at the, the standard Jewish law called Shulchan Aruch, etc., etc. Thousands of things added, not taught. And many others taken away, although there is no Torah mandate to replace sacrifice with prayer. This was done by the sages at the end of the first century. We were told that according to Deuteronomy 17, there is authority to the rabbis to teach what the Bible actually says. What Deuteronomy 17, beginning in verse 9, actually does is gives the, sage, the, the Levitical priest or judge in that day to be someone of a supreme court to decide cases of civil, civil law, homicide, assault, etc. It does not give them authority to say who the Messiah is or not, or when you should pray or when you shouldn't pray, or what words you should say. But this is what the Talmudic tradition actually says. If they tell you right is left, you do what they say. Let me take it a step further. If they tell you follow our traditions, and I'm giving to you what Moses Maimonides said in his introduction to his commentary on the Mishnah, if a prophet proven by God with miracles says to you follow the plain sense of the scripture and that plain sense violates the tradition of the sages, he's a false prophet, kill him. He should be put to death. Let me take it a step further. According to a classic passage in the Talmud, Bava Metziah 59b, God himself can be overruled by the majority of the sages. In other words, if the majority of the rabbi says this is what the law says and God from heaven says that's not true, you can overrule him. What's that based on? Exodus 23.2. The Hebrew clearly says do not follow the majority to pervert justice. However, the words don't follow the majority were cut down to follow the majority. According to Chief Rabbi Hertz in his commentary on the Pentateuch, page 316, he says the rabbis disregarded the literal meaning of the last three words of the verse. The verse says don't follow the majority. It got taken to say follow the majority even if it means overruling God. I say very clearly it's not Jesus or the New Testament that has deviated from the Hebrew Bible. I say this with pain. I myself have written on anti-Semitism in the so-called church. I have written about the beauty that is to be found in rabbinic Judaism and don't make all these people into demonic monsters. I have to say in all candor though that the rabbinic faith has departed from scripture. I could multiply examples on and on and on. Time however won't permit me to do that. We were told that following Jesus, recognizing him as son of God is idolatry. I would suggest that you look at various Hebrew roots, take a concordance, look up avad, which means to serve or worship, look up hishtachava, which means to bow down before or prostrate, look up the Aramaic verb palach, which means to serve or worship, and you will see that all of these are spoken of God and the earthly or messianic king in Psalm 72 and Psalm 18, for example, in Daniel chapter 7. We are told to worship and serve God, but it also says that the Israelites will worship or serve or bow down before the Messianic King. There's nothing idolatrous about that. According to the New Testament, Yeshua, Yeshua Jesus is the Word made flesh. The Aramaic concept is the Memra of the Lord. 
And I could quote passage after passage from the ancient Aramaic traditions called the Targum. For example, that the Memra, the word of the Lord, created man. That Abraham believed in the word of the Lord. That the word of the Lord will be my God, according to Jacob. On and on with citations. Is that idolatry or is that saying God revealed himself through his word? The one that Psalm 2 calls the son of God, the anointed messianic king. Nothing idolatrous about it. Again, if there's any question, if you need more citations, I'd be happy to give them to you. It is utterly untrue that according to the New Testament, New Israel has superseded old. What Paul is saying is that the Gentiles have become spiritual children of Abraham by faith. What Paul says in Romans 2.29, as recognized in most modern translations, it is not the one who is just a Jew physically, who is a true Jew, but the one who is a, tr a Jew inwardly. In other words, between two Jews, who is the real Jew? The one who's one outwardly only, or the one who's one inwardly? When he says, not all who are Israel are Israel, not all who are physically and truly Israel are of the spiritual seed of Israel. Read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and you will see that Paul addresses Gentile believers and talks to them about Israel and says that Israel is loved by God although rejected in mass because of their rejection of the Messiah and God cares for them and God will restore them. I've documented this very clearly in the idea that the church is spiritual Israel is a later idea that yes has opened itself up to terrible problems and yes gross persecution by so-called Christians of the Jewish people. But if you go through the biblical text carefully, take out a concordance, go through the New Testament, look up every time it says Israel, every time it says Jew, you'll find several hundred occurrences and only two or three possible where he could be talking, or the New Testament could be talking about the church. What did Paul mean when he said there's neither Jew nor Greek, etc.? What he was saying was this. Rabbinic prayer, every morning you say, thank God that I'm not a Gentile, thank, the man says this, I thank God that I'm not a woman, I thank God that I'm not a slave, because only a male Jew is required to keep all the commandments, a free male Jew. Paul says in God, in the Messiah, all have equal access. Jew, Gentile, we all have equal standing. But he said there's neither male nor female. So far, in 2,000 years of the church, I haven't seen a man give birth to a child yet point is very simple. He doesn't mean that male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave free cease to exist, but rather that we all have equal standing in God's sight. As to this notion that Galatians teaches that those who are circumcised don't need Jesus, what Paul is saying, anyone can read the context here, is that according to Galatians, Paul is writing to Gentiles who want to add something and say, believing in Jesus is not enough. I need to add something. So what are they going to add? They're going to add circumcision, keep the law. Paul says, then you're a debtor to keep the whole thing. Then you don't need Jesus. If you're going to try and do that, then try and work it out on your own. But aren't all who are under the works of the law under a curse? Yes, if you say, I will be justified by the law, and if I break the commandments, let the curse of God come on me, that's trouble. We need help. We need atonement. We need grace. And that's where the whole issue of Messiah comes in. There are more points made that, uh, again, time forbids me from uh, refuting. I think you've seen, though, that there's no substance to any of the charges made thus far. But let me go through this very quickly in the remaining nine or ten minutes. According to Malachi, the third chapter, the messenger of the Lord was to come and prepare the way for the Lord at the second temple. That temple, according to Rabbi David Kimchi, leading medieval expositor, that messenger of the covenant was the Messiah. He was expected 2,000 years ago before the temple was destroyed. According to Haggai, the second chapter, the glory of the second temple would be greater than the glory of the first. And yet there was no outward presence of God and supernatural manifestation. It wasn't just a matter of silver and gold and nice building. It had to be more than that. How was the glory of the second temple greater than the glory of the first? According to Daniel, the ninth chapter, before the second temple was destroyed, atonement for sin had to be made and righteousness brought in. And the Messiah, or an anointed one, would be cut off. All this had to happen before the second temple was destroyed. Not only so, there's a rabbinic tradition in Yoma 39b that says 
that for the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, God no longer accepted the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. What happened 40 years before the temple was destroyed? The Messiah died on the cross. Well, you say, did the Messianic era start 2,000 years ago? Where is it? This question is raised in the Talmud. There's a Talmudic statement in Sanhedrin 97a and b that the world would exist for 6,000 years. 2,000 years of desolation, 2,000 years of Torah, 2,000 years of Messiah, but because of our sins, all these years have gone by. The 2,000 years were to begin of Torah were to begin with Abraham. When did he live? About 2,000 years before Jesus. The next 2,000 years, meaning these last 2,000, were supposed to be the era of Messiah. What happened? Did he come or didn't he come, as the prophet said, and as even the Talmud expected? According to the Vilna Gaon, the most respected authority, Lithuanian Jew Jewry 300 years ago, he said, you may not see it now, but the Messianic era is actually here, meaning over 1,500 years ago. He said it was ushered in to bring the world into apostasy, and then at the end of that total apostasy, Messiah would come. I say quite the opposite. Malachi was right. Haggai was right. Daniel was right. Messiah did come. The era has begun. Now, it's important that you realize that David was not just a king, but was also recognized as priest. No, he didn't function as an official priest, but according to Psalm 110, either spoken to David or by David. It cannot refer to Abraham, as some later commentaries claim. It is said, olam. You are a priest forever. 2 Samuel 8, 18 says, David's sons were kohanim. Interesting. It was the job of the priest to make atonement for sin, among other things. And David typifies the one who is king, yet also priest. According to Zechariah chapter 3 and chapter 6, you can also find references in the fourth chapter, Yehoshua, elsewhere in the, in the Hebrew scriptures called Yeshua, or Jesus if you want to put it in English, was to be a sign of the tzemach, the branch, who is universally recognized as Messiah. But he was a priest. According to Zechariah, priest, uh, Zechariah 6, he would be a priest sitting on his throne. So a sign, the one typifying Messiah, was to be a priest sitting on his throne. Messiah dealt with sin. And there's a rabbinic tradition that says that the death of the righteous brings atonement. In fact, according to Orthodox Jewish Rabbi Beryl Wine, it was an old Jewish tradition dating back to biblical times that the death of the righteous and innocent served as an expiation for the sins of the nation or the world. And since the temple was destroyed, a medieval chronicle says, Jewish chronicle, it is the death of the righteous that has served as atonement for the sins of the generation. Is that biblical? Well, we do have the principle of sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible which Rashi says the blood is in the life and therefore the life substitutes for life. In other words, there's a principle of innocent life for guilty life. But it goes beyond that. When the Maccabees were being slaughtered in their fight to liberate the people of God 150 years and more before Jesus came, prayers of theirs were recorded, may my death be an expiation for my people. There are rabbinic traditions that say even though Isaac didn't die on the altar, it was credited as if he did die, and the blood of Isaac is remembered by God. There's a New Year's prayer that's prayed in the synagogues, the time of Yom Kippur, an additional prayer saying, God, remember the sacrifice of Isaac and forgive the sins of Israel. But is this really a biblical concept? According to the book of Numbers, it deals with the death of the high priest, and it tells us that when the high priest dies, a man who has innocently killed someone can be released from exile. According to the Talmud, Makot 11b, the death of the high priest atones. According to the Talmud, Moed Katan 28a, the death of the righteous brings atonement. Still, I say, we have some examples in Bible, but is it really clear? Yes, it's clearly taught beyond any contradiction in Isaiah 53. Surely our sicknesses he's born, he's pierced for our transgressions. Avon Kulano, God caused to light on him the iniquity of us all, who hate Rabim Nasa, he bore the sin of many. This one, the servant of the Lord, who brings to fulfillment the destiny of Israel. 
laid down his life as the righteous one making atonement for the sins of the world. Now according to Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49, this Messiah was to be a light to the nations. You see, he had to first come and deal with sin. Isaiah 53 tells us he would be rejected by his own people. Isaiah 49 also tells us he would be rejected by his own people. God's consolation is, you will be a light to the nations. I've been around the world, it's been my privilege to be in many nations, to see people who were Hindus, worshiper of idols, who now worship the one true God and love the Jewish people, and fast and pray for God's blessing on Israel. I know people who were former terrorists, people who were communist activists slicing people up alive, you name it, drug addicts, prostitutes, around the world, people in every false religion, and they have come to love the God of the Bible And the most amazing thing is, contrary to the outward history of an often apostate church that has persecuted Israel and has besmirched the name of Jesus horribly and brought untold suffering upon the Jewish people and the world, as well as butchered true Christians, contrary to that, I have seen phenomenal universal love for Israel, black pastors in America getting up in synagogues telling Jews, we will lay our lives down for you if you are threatened. Pastors in Sweden spending unbelievable amounts of money to buy a huge boat to help Jews make the Aliyah back to the land. Why? Because they love Israel. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, yes, they think they should believe in him, but they're going to love him anyway. Messiah has been a light to the nations. The word of Messiah has been going little by little by little all around the world. And now, at this end of the age, as we get closer and closer and closer, and more and more people, through the most influential Jew that's ever lived, Jesus, and through the most influential Jewish document that's ever been written, the New Testament, now this message has gone to the ends of the earth, and what's written in the prophets? That after this time, we Jewish people would recognize that it was for us that he came and turned back to him. It's happening. Even if people tell us we're not Jews, we're going to follow the scripture. Even if we're told we don't have a right to the Torah, it's our Torah, we'll keep it. We need a new covenant because, in fact, about half the commandments can't be kept without temple and sacrifice. Either God is left without a solution or he's instituted a new covenant. And now, through the writing of the New Testament, we can understand how to follow God in spirit and in truth. And let me just say, lastly, that the rabbis asked the question, will the Messiah come riding on a donkey? Or will he come in the clouds of heaven? Will, will, he be exalt, will, he, will he die in battle? Or will he rule and reign? Which? Both. He will come on a donkey and he will come in the clouds of heaven. According to Isaiah 52, 13, he will be highly exalted. According to 52, 14, he will greatly suffer. First the suffering, then the exaltation. Rejected by his people, a light to the nations, having paid for our sins and ushered in eternal redemption. At the end of the age, he will return. And then all the other things Rabbi Shochet spoke about will come to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown.